in J equals zero state uh, of the of the diatom. So if we uh, compare all these things, uh, we we have uh, I, uh, well I didn't say it, but beta zero, beta one zero is, is also increasing as a function of the ratio. Uh, of the well depth divided by the vibrational frequency. And that's something which was also noticed by, uh, for neutral system by Nikitin. And it is a crude measurement of the efficiency of the vibrational energy redistribution. Uh, at very low collision energy, of course, the long range play uh, an important role, uh, which is uh, modeled by the Langevin formula proportional to the polarizability and to the relative mass, which is also uh, important. So we define what we call a statistical capture rate constant. So in fact, uh, if you look at uh, all papers of Ferguson, you will see that he made the same hypothesis of splitting the, uh, the process in two steps. A first step where you capture, uh, donc, uh, and, and form the complex, and the redistribution is, is then done inside the complex. So, uh, and we multiply it, so by the ratio d over omega e. So uh, this scheme uh, relies on a statistical ansatz, which is valid for collision involving a deep in intermediate well at ultra low temperature. So as I say, divide the process in two steps. You form first a long lived collision complex, and then you, uh, it is followed by its fragmentation uh, to produce a vibrational quench diatomic cation. And so if we now represent so the statistical capture uh, rate formula for all the systems we have uh, treated, and here it is the close coupling uh, value of the vibrational quenching, you see that it follows uh, there is a link, uh, apparently. Uh, it, we, uh, from this, at least for these five systems, we can predict the efficiency of the vibrational uh, quenching, knowing only, uh, well, one need to know the well depth of the complex, vibrational constant, uh, sorry, vibrational frequency of the diatom, polarizability uh, of uh, the atom, uh, and the relative mass. And from that, we can predict if it's going to be efficient or not. So you see that Helium CH plus is the only one which is a bit uh, outside uh, this, uh, this variation. Uh, but uh, it was shown in our uh, paper dedicated to this system that it is due to virtual state scattering, uh, which is simply a way to say that there is a bond state which energy is nearly zero. Uh, so that was uh, in 2016, and then we decided to uh, to see if it works for uh, other systems because five uh, five system is possibly not uh, enough to say <laughs> that it is low. Uh, so uh, we decided to take a vibrational frequency which is intermediate between the two. So we choose the ALO plus, and we varied the partner. So. Varying the partner allows us to vary the polarizability and to vary also, of course, the well depth, which is, which is increasing also, and the relative mass. And you see that each time it's really uh, linked. And uh, so this work was done uh, by uh, Otoniel uh, Denis Alpiza. Uh, he is one of my former PhD students and is now. Uh, he has a permanent position now in Santiago. So he calculated the three uh, surfaces, and uh, you see uh, so the, they are uh, relatively similar, but uh, uh, of course uh, deeper and deeper. And now, this is what we get. So we have still uh, uh, a line, uh, so, so, but uh, it is not as uh, it, it is not a straight line. Huh? We, we, we have still a, a strong correlation, uh, but it is not a straight line. Uh, but again, we can predict the efficiency of uh, of the vibrational quenching uh, for these systems by this, this simple law. 
well. Uh, I think uh, that uh, I will not repeat uh, or what I said uh, before. I will simply uh, thank you uh, for uh, your attention and also all the collaborators involved in, uh, in, this, uh, in this study. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, they are not highly polarizable, no. Yeah, they are not really. Yeah. They may not take this lot of energy away. Yeah. It should be an isotropic interaction. That's maybe why it didn't really think they Well, yes, and also, but they are, because in fact, uh, what, what is the difficult to see on this figure is that, uh, uh, in fact, you have uh, many points in a small region because uh, the variational frequency of the partner was always almost 2,000. So it's difficult to, to, to really see if it is only linked to that or not. Uh, so there are several other systems that I... Uh, yeah. Uh, for example, I, uh, I didn't have time to add it, but uh, I did it also for another system uh, calculated by Otoniel. It's Helium CF plus, and uh, it follows also uh, well the, the rule. So, well, it's not a straight line, of course. No, so it's <laughs> absent minded, so thank you. Uh, yes, so I will tell uh, about our combined uh, theoretical and experimental efforts on the way to reach ultra cold quantum regime in ion atom systems, because during the last two days we have heard that there are lots of efforts, but still we are in relatively warm uh, collision regime. So I will try to dis dis discuss like two possible ways uh, to somehow reach the, the, the few or even single partial wave regime. So, I mean, it was already justified why this field is so interesting and exciting, but I will just repeat that like we want to combine ultra cold atoms and ultra cold atoms are great systems because we can have relatively large number of atoms we can have relatively long coherence time for these systems uh, they are still very fully controllable and what is the most interesting they are fully quantum uh, matter uh, then on the other hand we have the trapped ions then they are much smaller systems they are the number of ions that can be trapped is smaller but they are strongly interacting and because they are strongly interacting so then the time they 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 the operational times are uh, are slower they are faster in operations uh, then they are fully controllable and what is also interesting in the context what was uh, told by Tomaso Calarco or uh, Antonio that uh, Probably trapped ions are much easier to transfer to technology than cold atoms, so they can be the kind of gate uh, to technological applications. Uh, and uh, in our community, we, uh, we want to combine uh, these ions with atoms in one hybrid systems, and hopefully the, all the nice features of these two systems on their own will be inherited, and also some new, new emerging features will be, will be there, and these two systems will be coupled by, by relatively strong ion-atom interactions. And uh, there are many applications that were discussed during this workshop, but 
for me because I'm partially chemist, so cold control chemistry is very interesting, but also precision measurements and a lot of applications, possible applications in quantum simulation, computational sensing can also come. Uh, and uh, from the perspective of the first part of my talk, especially the simulations, quantum simulations of, uh, of, of, of solid state physics will be interesting. So these are the plots from two proposals uh, where in one of them the, the, um, uh, the emulation of solid state physics with the linear uh, chain of he heavy uh, ytterbium ions in a trap uh, surrounded by fermionic atoms was presented. And the idea is that it was shown in this paper uh, that in this kind of arrangement, the, the fermions around these heavy ions can form kind of band structure and they can be used to simulate the, real, the properties of real materials. And also there were some proposals on Josephson Junction, but, uh, but because the experimental group of Rene, Rene Gritzma is, is on the way to realize this, this will be the most important justification for the first part of my work. But as it was already pointed by a by few people, especially Ronnie Ozeri, that we have always micro motion in the trap. So even if we have like excellent setup when we can correct it to, to, to 100 micro, micro Kelvin, still it's, it is there, so it can be the problem. So then of course, it would be the best to use the system that is the most suitable. And there were a few proposals when, where people investigated what systems are the best for this. And it happens that most probably the systems where the mass ratio of the ion to the atom is the largest. So then uh, one of the most heavy ions that we can have is ytterbium, the lightest atom that we can have at ultra cold temperatures is lithium. So it suggests that ytterbium ion plus lithium atoms can be one of the systems where we can be the closest to the S-wave regime with, uh, with, with uh, correcting the, with, with, like having uh, the best uh, uh, micro motion uh, correction and so on. Uh, but also there is the other problem that uh, once we have ion atom systems, usually there is quite complicated uh, chemistry or, or dynamics at short range. So we can have several, several processes, like we can, can have non-radiative uh, 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 charge transfer when the charge is transferred by some uh, couplings between electronic states at short range. We can have radiative charge transfer. We can have also radiative association to the ground state. Uh, and all this has to be included. And in fact, because uh, this, all this happens at short range, so the, the, the approaches which use only the, uh, the, the asymptotic description, anyway, they usually need some input about specific couplings from on the short range, in contrast to, the, to other systems that sometimes only the, uh, or the universal properties of the systems can be uh, calculated from only the long range part of, of the dynamics. So there are a few challenges, like um, uh, including or avoiding uh, radiative non-radiative or radiative charge transfers and association losses. So we still would like to have control over ion atom interactions. So it was presented that by controlling the spin, we can have some control. And of course, the, 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 the one of the best solutions would be to access the Feshbach resonances that are so commonly used in the, in the cold atom community. But to do this, we have to really go to the few or even single S-wave partial uh, regime, and we are still far away. And also, we have also always deal with the uh, micro motion if we use pole trap. So then maybe the idea is to use something else. Okay, so in this plot, I combined or we combined uh, the, 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 uh, the, the experiments that were realized. I hope I didn't miss any of any any. Uh, in the cold regime, so we can see that uh, still the best, the lowest temperatures that are achieved are around millikelvin, and then uh, the, we also plotted here the the position of the characteristic energy scale defined by, by by this expression for for the ion atom systems, and it can be compared to the to the high, highest of the P wave barrier. So what we can see that we are even in the in the best best cases like for the systems with the smallest reduced mass, we are at least two orders of magnitude from the S-wave regime. And for most of the systems, we are five of six orders of magnitude. So it's rather a huge gap that, of course, uh, all people uh, here are trying to, to, to skip, but, but there is a huge gap. So, so of course, among these systems, probably the best, if we want really to go to few partial waves, is to choose the system which, where we are the closest to the uh, to, the, to, the, to the quantum regime, to the single partial or few partial wave regime. And then the best would be to use the systems with the smallest reduced mass. So the smallest reduced mass will be for systems containing lithium atoms like ytterbium plus lithium or, 
or, or calcium, uh, calcium ions plus lithium, uh, or the other solutions to be avoid uh, pole trap and go directly to ultra cold regimes. And so in my first, the first part of my talk, I will present the efforts uh, on the systems of ytterbium plus ion and lithium atom, uh, which uh, I investigated theoretically a few years ago. And, and recently, René Geritzma at University of Amsterdam uh, is pushing towards uh, realization and the first results have been obtained. Uh, and in the, other, in the second part, I will present the new proposal where we want to access directly the ion atom scattering in the ultra cold regime by, by, by using the Rydberg molecules where we, uh, where we specifically to, to have the, uh, the, the S-wave regime at as high temperature as possible, we use the, the gas of lithium atoms because uh, this will, but uh, presenting this table, I will uh, take a moment to make a small advertisement that uh, together with, uh, with uh, Paul Julien, Zbyszek Idziaszek, Tomaso Kolarko, Antonio Negretti, René Geritzma and Krzysztof Jakimski, we prepared a review article about the system because we found that, like already one or two and a half, two years ago, we found that some kind of complete and broad review that would be accessible both for PhD students and who, who include all the works is missing. So we prepared this and because most of people here has lots of contributions. So uh, I would like probably next weekend at the beginning of the next, next week to send uh, this like PDF uh, and to ask if, to, to check, for example, if uh, we correctly, if we, first of all, if we included all important or all your works or if we cite and describe them correctly, because of course, before we put it on archive, we would be sure that we don't miss any important work or we didn't uh, mm, forgot to mention some great works. Okay, so now moving back to the, to, the, to the research. So the first part will be devoted to uh, the theoretical description and first experimental results for the ytterbium ion plus lithium system. And in the second part, uh, I will go to our new proposal uh, with the, which is under construction in the tillman faust uh, uh, group. Okay, so as I mentioned, this system has one of the smallest uh, reduced mass that can be imagined for ion atom systems among the combination that we have now accessible in experiments. And for these reasons, we should be the closest to the single uh, partial wave and quantum regime when we can hope to observe some resonances and um, maybe even the flashback resonances to control uh, ion atom uh, interactions. Uh, ah, then this work, theoretical part, the first theoretical part was realized with Christiane Koch and Robert Moszynski, who were my uh, PhD advisors, and then uh, the next part and uh, calculations for more excited states were realized recently with the group of René Geritzma at Amsterdam. Okay, so this is the structure of the lithium ytterbium ion, so the system, uh, when you have these two atoms, uh, and it's ionized. Uh, the entrance channel here is quite well separated from other thresholds, so this suggests uh, at the beginning that this, is, that this, is, this system should be uh, relatively uh, uh, immune again, against, uh, against uh, radiative or non-radiative charge transfers because there is no uh, direct coupling between these entrance channels with other electronic states, so there will be not radiative. There will be no non-radiative uh, uh, losses, and at the same time, uh, the, the energy release in this transition is relatively small, so it also helps that the uh, radiative losses and radiative association to the ground state should be relatively small. Uh, yes, and for the lowest excited state, we were able to calculate quite accurately this potential energy curves, curves, curves using uh, quant methods of quantum chemistry. Uh, we calculated the transition electric dipole moments, and where, where it's very important to remember that transition dipole moment between the Entrance channel uh, and exit channel, where we have charge transfer, is strictly vanishing at large internuclear distances. So, so, so any transition up or down, they are strictly uh, forbidden at large distances. So it's not, uh, it's, it's, it should not be mixed with the, for example, intercombination line transitions where uh, the, tra the dipole transition is forbidden. But still, we have small admixtures at even infinitely large distances, and and and. Uh, and the physics is a bit different. So there are these uh, transition dipole moments that vanish exponentially because of the symmetry of charge transfer. Uh, and of course, there are some asymptotes, some excited states that have the same uh, uh, arrangement of charges. And then, of course, the transition dipole moment asymptotically is allowed because it approaches the uh, transition dipole moment in the ion or atom, respectively. 
So in this system, as I mentioned, we can have spontaneous radiative charge transfer or radiative association. There are two uh, first usually to, to be considered in this kind of systems. Uh, but of course, to know if the charge transfer or radiative losses are problematic or no, we should have some estimations of the elastic collisions because once uh, the elastic collisions are much, much larger than any losses collisions, then probably we have still enough time to realize our quantum simulation or computation application without being worried about, about uh, losing uh, our ions or, or, or some decoherence processes. Uh, so this, this are, um, some, uh, these are the, the rates for elastic, for elastic, elastic uh, scattering, and we see that in the millikelvin regime, uh, independent of the state or the reduced mass, uh, they, they took the value around 10 to minus 8 uh, centimeters square per uh, second. And this has to be compared to the radiative charge transfer losses. And this uh, plot shows the radiative charge transfer losses uh, calculated for this system. So for two isotopes, so we didn't scan in this picture systematically the scattering length. We just took two, two systems with relatively different scattering length. And we see, first of all, that, of course, the behavior is typical for the Langevin uh, capture dynamics. Then at some temperatures of several to 100 millikelvins, there are some shape resonance. If we look on the scattering, or if we look on the rates uh, with the energy, uh, in the rate for the given energy, but of course, in the system we have thermal distribution, so we have to take average over these calculations, and then this dashed line shows the, uh, the rates that can be expected in experiments, so they are quite well averaged, so in this system we don't rather expect any shape resonances to be measurable at, 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 at any temperatures. But then what is also quite important and interesting and typical for most of the ion atom systems that are used, uh, that when we decompose the total rate for radiative charge transfer uh, or, rad or radiative uh, charge losses, uh, that uh, the contribution from the radiative charge transfer, when the charge is only transferred and the atoms are still free, they don't, fo they don't, don't form bound, bound, uh, bound molecules, is much smaller. So it, in fact, most of, the, most of the losses in this kind of collisions leads to the formation, to the association of, 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 of the... Of the, of the Mm, of the molecules, or at least this is what we expect from our calculations. Uh, but as I mentioned, because uh, it's impossible for systems larger than, uh, let's say, five, six electron systems to, to calculate from first, first principle scattering lens, so I, I believe that always any scattering calculations should be cross-checked with, uh, with the possibility that the scattering lens are different. So. To do this, one of the approaches can be to scale simply the full interaction potentials because by scaling potentials, we change the scattering length. So we did it for, for our system in the range which correspond to more or less the, 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 the appearance of one additional bound state. So we scan the full, full range of the scattering lengths. Uh, and we see, and this, the results are presented for two temperatures, for one millikelvin and for 10 microkelvin, where 10 microkelvin should be the temperature where we expect already just few partial waves. And we see that there is some dependence, there are some resonances once the bound states appear in the system, once they cross the threshold. But, but when we look on the ratio, we see that in fact for most of the, most of the possible scattering lengths, the ratio is quite large. So it means that uh, this system is very favorable in the, in, the, in, in the context of the ratio of elastic to, 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 to inelastic uh, collisions. So we, we have to be really unlucky to really to have the scattering length that correspond really to this deep somewhere there. So yeah, we can be unlucky, but, but, uh, but then we can change the isotope and, and then, uh, then the, the position of the bound states for different, different reduced mass are different and then we never uh, be for two different uh, or few different uh, isotopic uh, mixtures uh, at the same position of this curve. So this system is quite pro 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 quite optimistic when we think about the the, the, the losses that can be problematic. Uh, but uh, because I like molecules, so it's also interesting for me to see what kind of molecules are produced in this kind of association uh, collisions. And this is the, the composition of the, or this is like the state dependent rates for, for the formation of, uh, of molecules in the ground, of molecular ions in the ground state for versus different binding energy. And we see that the most probably is the formation of, uh, of, the, of, of, of the molecular ions with binding energy around 1,200 
uh, wave numbers. And uh, this is, again, quite typical for all the ion atom system that we have now in our experiments, that uh, because the transition dipole moment, the, the decay uh, exponentially with the intermolecular distance, then the transition probability to, 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 the, to the most weakly bound state is really suppressed. So it's really in contrast to what is observed in the photoassociation experiments with neutral atoms, where usually we have, we have access only to, to weakly or, or relatively weakly bound state. Here, the most probable is the formation of deeply bound states. And also, I compared in this plot the, 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 the formation rates for, for two different temperatures. So for 100 nanokelvins, that is, of course, completely out of reach now and probably for many years, but maybe I hope to be wrong. Uh, and uh, then we have, we have only single partial regime, so we, have, we produce molecules only in the uh, P wave because we have collision in the S wave. But once we are that temperature of 10 microkelvin, uh, it's the temperature where, where we have already mixture of S and P wave collisions, then we produce molecular ions in uh, four different, uh, different partial, uh, or three different partial waves, in fact, because the fourth is, is negligible to show that we have like really this two partial waves in the collision and then three partial waves, three possible partial waves of the, as the output. Uh, okay, but so once we have this, uh, we can compare, we can see that the, the rates for this uh, individual, individual transition are relatively small and they are also much smaller than the uh, rates for the elastic collision. So we can hope that we can maybe by applying laser field to induce. So the, 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 they can, you can think about or photo association to the excited state or kind of photo association to the ground state. It's more properly to tell about this like stabilization to some uh, selected bound state in the ground state potential. And by applying laser field, we can hope that we can drive and form the molecules, the molecular ions in some in selected, selected uh, vibrational state. And this is the spectrum for the photo association for some reasonable chosen intensity of the laser field. And we can see two most important features. First of all, the shape of, of this spectrum is very similar to the shape of the, uh, of the, of the spontaneous radiation for uh, association because, because both this transition and the spontaneous, radi radi spontaneous uh, uh, radiative association, they are governed by the same uh, Frank Condon factors or and, vibration, and, and transition dipole moments, so it's not uh, uh, surprising. Uh, and also, mm, we can see that the rates here are around two orders of magnitude larger than the rates for the spontaneous radiative association. So we can really hope that we can selectively address the formation of the molecular, molecular ions in some, in some selected, selected levels. Uh, we can also think about that typical photo association going to some excited states, but it's not, again, typical as in the any neutral system because the dipole moment vanish uh, with the distance really strictly. And then we have, again, the spectrum that is very similar. So the, again, the probability of formation of the uh, relatively deeply bound or the, the states, the levels from the middle of the wall is the largest. And then the formation of the most weakly bound uh, molecular levels is really, really, really suppressed because there is no transition electric dipole moment at the large internuclear distances because of the uh, strict suppression of it. Uh, Okay, so uh, once we investigated the impact of the laser field, we also looked on the impact of the magnetic field. So it's because we would like really to have the control of the scattering lens of the ion atom systems. And one of this, one of the possibilities to use Feshbach resonances. So these are the, some example plots for the different mix, azotopic mixtures of the uh, ethereum ions and lithium atoms uh, for few temperatures. So at, of course, in the ultra cold regime at 100 nanokelvins, the resonances are really very well pronounced. Then once we go to larger, larger temperatures, we see that already at 10 microkelvins, the, the, the resonances are much less pronounced. So please uh, note that the scales are completely different. So here we have many orders of magnitude. Here we have two orders of magnitude, or even one order of magnitude. And here we have linear scale. So, so once at 100 nanokelvins, of course, the resonances will be very pronounced. At 10, millike, 10, mic, 10 microkelvins, we can have, we can still hope to see something, but of course, at one millikelvin, uh, this will be completely negligible, especially that uh, this is, this result don't include yet thermal averaging. So thermal averaging for one millikelvin completely wash it. Uh, but once we, this is for the elastic, elastic scattering. Uh, but once we look, look at that, at radiative, radiative losses, we can see something a bit different. So the resonances are a bit more pronounced once we go to larger temperatures. 
And the reason for this is because uh, the radiative losses, they are governed not by the reflection or, or scattering from the centrifugal barrier, that is what we have for, uh, for, 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 for elastic scattering. And then just for the larger partial waves, we have uh, scattering from the barrier, and then we have more and more contribution to the, scat to the, to the elastic scattering from, from the centrifugal barrier. Uh, for radiative losses, any, any losses that are governed by the short range part, and this is short range uh, physics. So for these processes, we, have, we need tunneling of the scattering wave function to short range to have losses. So then really uh, the, 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 the resonances will, will be there because there is no contribution from, uh, from higher partial waves uh, to this process. Okay, so now this were the results that we presented two years ago, uh, and now there will be the results, new results of the experiment uh, in Amsterdam that was realized. They were realized by René Geritzma. So uh, he built the system, and he have the iterbium ions in the pole trap with the uh, lithium uh, fermionic lithium atoms in the uh, mod, and uh, in the future he will put it to the dipole trap. So first, as a check that the system works and and we understand what is going on inside. Uh, he investigated the charge exchange mm, uh, charge transfer process, uh, depending on the uh, co collision energy, depending on the isotope, and depending on the electronic state. So here are the example results versus energy for two different isotopes and two different states, like P uh, one half and D uh, three half uh, states. So we can see that there is. Uh, uh, like they are independent on energy, so we can we, this confirms that yes, we are in the Langevin uh, regime. They are also relatively not; they don't depend visibly on the on the isotope, but of course, but they depend strongly on the electronic state of the iterbium ion. So once we put this in the table, we can see that yes. So for the ground state, uh, it was in this system the density of ion atoms is not enough to to cal to to have the accurate results, accurate values of the of the loss rate, so there are, there are only estimation of the maximum possible and to, to have the, the, the proper, to, to, because it's not possible to distinguish these losses from the, some background losses, but for the excited states, uh, we have measurements and we can see that yeah, for two states, for P and F state, uh, the, the radiative loss, the exchange loss, the, not the radiative, the exchange, exchange trans, uh, charge exchange losses are, are really, really, really huge. Uh, like half of the uh, classical uh, Langevin rate collision, and for this state it's much, much smaller. And then, of course, the question is, uh, can we explain it, and how to, can, we, can we provide some theoretical uh, this explanation for this rate? So, to do this, I tried to calculate the, the interaction curves for the excited states of the lithium iterbium system, and unfortunately, it's very heavy, it's very problematic system. It's heavy because the iterbium is heavy, but it's also very heavy because it's complicated. So for the, <laughs> for the ground state, uh, we have this curves from the previous calculation and we, we, we are quite sure about accuracy, but unfortunately, once we go to higher and higher states, then we start to have excited state of the iterbium ion and iterbium atom where the F shell start to be open. And this is the huge problem because in the F shell in the iterbium, we have 14 electrons and, and, uh, and uh, 14 electrons on seven, uh, seven orbitals, then combining, these 14 electrons with the other electrons from lithium and the need to put these electrons onto the orbitals of not only the ground valence, not only to the, on the valence orbitals, but also on few, several excited state, uh, state orbitals, uh, we start to have uh, this, this system that compositionally is not treatable with the present ab initio codes. Uh, so this results, in fact, presents only the curves that are obtained in the non-relativistic approximation. So the not spin orbit coupling is not yet included here. And also we didn't include excitation from the F shell in, in this picture. So we see that we have already this spaghetti regime without, with, we, but neglecting uh, probably more than 50% of states that are there. And unfortunately, there is no really hope to, uh, to calculate these curves enough accurately uh, to do the full uh, calculation. So for this, for the explanation of this, it's rather possible. We, I think we are now aiming to, uh, to build some effective models similar to what was presented uh, yesterday by the, by the results from Svetlana uh, group. Uh, but still, we hope to gain some at least intuition, intuition and qua, uh, quant, uh, quantitative, uh, qualitative, qualitative explanation. Uh, <laughs> and, and yes, and we can have some. Okay, so ah, because uh, b b maybe before I will go to this explanation, I would like to tell what are the biggest problems in the system. So when we have the many electrons strongly correlated, so we have 
two problems. So first of all, we have dynamic, we have to include dynamic correlation. So this is typical that is in all quantum many body problems uh, that has to be included. And this is for electrons. This is like in the classical way it can be explained that electrons avoid each other and they know. So the mean field approximation does not include this. And we have to include that there are possible solution to this. One of them is configuration interaction method. The other is couplet cluster method. And there are many other methods depending on the system. And then there is also the second problem that we have to include static correlation. And static correlation in our case is the part of the total energy that is coming from the fact uh, that we cannot describe the reference state as a single reference, as a single state determinant state. So it means that uh, we cannot use the methods that are based on the mean field solution based on the single state determinant. And unfortunately, once we include the many possible reference states, and then we want to combine it with many possible configuration needed to describe correctly dynamical, uh, dynamic correlation, we start to have uh, billions uh, of, 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 of terms in our wave function, and, and it's too much for our classical computers. Uh, but so, so the, uh, to, to sum up, so the problem is that we have to include excitation from F shell uh, in the ethereum atoms. We have huge spin orbit coupling. We have large density of states. So these are a problem for us. But at the same time, the experimental results provided for this system they are perfect for for testing and benchmarking our initial methods of electronic structure. Because now we have the system when we cannot really describe it correctly. So we have to use really the, the methods from the edge of the quantum chemistry. And hopefully, uh, the com com comparing the results provided by them can uh, can improve improve this method. But OK, so still, uh, we, we aim to have some qualitative explanation of the observed rates. And to do this, we looked on the spin orbit coupling and the nature of the states that surround the entrance channel. So, we have that for these three states, for the F state, we have a really huge spin orbit coupling. The huge spin orbit coupling that corresponds to the splitting between the two F states of the order of 10, of ta uh, of 10,000 wave numbers is extremely uh, huge. So it means that, in fact, the curves that in the non-relativistic pictures are somewhere there are, they, 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 they can be mixed with, 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 with tens of other, of other potentials. And for the, this, this state, we have very small spin orbit coupling or relatively small of the order of only one and a half thousand wave numbers, and for p state we have we have mixed. So, and somehow this the order of spin orbit coupling agree with the observed rates. So that yes, in fact, for f and p states we observe the largest charge transfer rates for uh, for d the smallest. But there is also other part of this of this story. So once we look on the nature of the or the electronic configuration of the threshold surrounding the the the, the, the entrance channels corresponding to the ion with this state. We can see that when we have F state, when you have ion in the F state, then uh, the, 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 the thresholds of the, and the thresholds, the other thresholds of the combination of ion atom the, and the other electronic state that surrounds the entrance electronic state, uh, they have the same con electronic configuration and especially they have the same configuration of F shell electrons. So it means that the charge transfer process involves only changing the position of one of the electron over, of the one electron in orbitals. Um, whereas for the D state, the, uh, the, the configuration of F shell electrons for the threshold that surround the threshold of the, uh, of the entrance threshold with the D state is of different nature. So we have completely different configuration of F, F, F orbitals because we have one of the electrons excited. And it means that the charge transfer process involves more than the rearrangement of one electron. And in fact, when we ask about the couplings, uh, non-adiabatic couplings between different uh, curves with this when, when there is difference of, of the configuration of F-shell electrons, we can see that the coupling is much different. So it means that the threshold in this case and this case when the, when the surrounding states are very, very similar is very, very strong. But when, the, when, when, we, ha when we calculate the overlaps, the, the coupling between the, uh, the, the states uh, that have different F-shell configuration, then the coupling is very small. So there are these two possible configurations. So we have to distinguish what is true. If it's, is it this spin orbit coupling or the or the nature of surrounding state, or maybe the resonant character of the entrance channel. But for this, we check that more or less for all the states, the position of the other states is, is, is similar. It's in the range of several, several hundred wave numbers. So, so rather the, the last uh, explanation is not the one. But to do this, we look on the other results. So in fact, we look on the results from uh, 2012 for the ethereum ion and, and rubidium atoms. And we found that for this system, in fact, the order of the rates for the losses were opposite. So it means that uh, in this experiment, uh, the, the losses for the, 
from the ytterbium ion in the D state was observed much, much larger than for, I mean, much larger, like order of magnitude larger than for, for F state, so it's opposite to our case. So explanation using the spin orbit coupling as an explanation is not true because apparently we have different results and we have still the same spin orbit coupling for the ytterbium ion. But then once we look on the, 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 the electronic state that surround these entrance channels here and here, we found that yes, in fact, uh, the electronic configuration of the thresholds around these two, uh, this two, this two, this en the entrance channel containing the ion in these two states, they are opposite to ours. So it means that, again, in this case, uh, if the ytterbium ions in this state, in the, this state where the losses were really, really, really strong, the, the, the entrance channel around this threshold, the entrance, uh, the, 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 the thresholds around this entrance channel, they have the same configuration of F electrons. And at the same time, they, they, the couplings between them and the entrance channel are much larger, so it's really allow for really strong and fast uh, non-radiative charge transfer, whereas for this state, in this case, it's opposite. And of course, the reason why it's diff the one this order is different for ytterbium plus rubidium and ytterbium plus lithium is because we have the curves, the energy levels of the ytterbium and, and uh, of the rubidium and lithium a bit different, so, so this state here and this state here, they, they have a bit different order. So, Finally, we found uh, that not spin orbit coupling, but rather the couplings between the surrounding states, uh, states surrounding the entrance channel as the crucial to explain the observed rates. And we are working on some more quantitative models, like uh, in, in, including, including uh, specifically different, different range of, 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 uh, of coupling between these this states. Okay, I hope I have still time. That uh, to to talk about my second part. Okay, uh, the second part is much 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 shorter. Uh, so I will talk about using Rydberg molecules for the ion for the at ion atom scattering. Uh, and uh, this work is realized with the uh, with the group of Tim and Fa where they are building the experiment. And first we we we, we did the calculation confirming that yes it will work. So, as we already have seen uh, last days, that it was it's possible to have single Rydberg excitation in the BEC. So, it's possible to have the single uh, uh, single ion in the BEC with the electron somewhere far, far away. So, in fact, if we looked at the system, it uh, corresponds that yes, we have bound state, but we have really the ion plus atom, and it's surrounded by this electron. So, in fact, inside. Inside, inside, uh, inside the system, when we have Rydberg, Rydberg atom and many atoms around, or we have Rydberg molecule, we have inside the system this ion atom system. So why not to use this arrangement to probe really the ion atom scattering and ion atom collision? So this was the idea. Let's use the Rydberg molecule state, for example, something like this, to have the initial wave packet for the dynamics. Then let's ionize the Rydberg molecule, like throwing away the electron, and then looking what is going on for the ion atom uh, scattering, uh, where the initial state for this ion atom system is described by the wave packet that was before the vibrational bound state of the Rydberg molecule. And, uh, and again, as I, I repeat this plot, so we were thinking about different systems. One, so first, of, first we decided that yes, we want the system that has the lowest mass, reduced mass, because we want to be as close as possible to the S-wave regime, and then we found that, of, that we have to use lithium atoms, so we checked several, several, uh, several ions that we can use, so for both lithium and rubidium, and we found that, first of all, it's what, we, what I present in the moment is quite universal, so we find it for several alkali, um, alkali Rydberg uh, atoms in the system, uh, and we decided that we will use lithium lithium, as this is the best case uh, that we can imagine, and this is the plot showing uh, the, the, the arrangement of the system. So we have the potential, the Bonhoeffenheimer potential for the Rydberg molecule. We have bound state corresponding to the, to the Rydberg molecule somewhere there. And in this plot, I presented results for both uh, lithium-7 and lithium-6, as the differences are not so, not so large. So, so the Rydberg molecules look quite similar for these two states. Uh, oh, this is logarithmic scale, so, so look uh, that it's uh, like a bit uh, maybe strange. Uh, uh, mm. It looks a bit strange because the it's logarithmic scale. Uh, then we also looked at okay, what is the rotational constant? And what versus the versus the the line width of the transition? So yes, the rotational constant is larger than the line typical line width for this transition. So we are we will be able to excite and produce really this bound state. 
uh, this, this, this lead back molecules for the ionization. Then ionization process is rather straightforward. And then after ionization, this is the, uh, the our, 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 uh, our initial wave packet decomposed into the scattering state of the ion, ion atom potential, or in fact, this is uh, Fourier transfer so of this wave packet. So we see that the most probable energy is quite close to this limit, to this S, S wave limit. So yes, we have, we have some tail of the higher energy. So the average energy of the initial wave packet is, is like two or three times the S wave regime. Uh, but we are really close to this. And second, because we start, uh, and I didn't mention that we decided to, to use the S wave mole, uh, S wave Rydberg molecules. So in fact, we checked all numbers from S to F, and we found that in fact, there is no advantage of using F or D or P, uh, P state Rydberg molecules, and we use S wave molecules. And at the same time, because we start from S wave, so somehow by the symmetry of the system, we restrict our collision to be only in the S wave if we can have very well control, very good control over the possible uh, uh, electric fields that are around. Okay, so we have this initial wave packet. Then I also presented two bound state of the ion atom potential because uh, because uh, uh, lithium lithium atom in opposite in the in the in the in the contrast to lithium ytterbium atom is very very sim very very small system when we have only five electrons. And already for four electron system, the, the exact, exact calculation of electronic structure are possible. And we try to do this the same. And in fact, we, we were able, we think we, are, we think we are able to predict more or less with not so bad uh, error bars, the scattering length for the collision of lithium ion with lithium atoms, because as uh, again, there are only five electrons and only one valence electron. Uh, and, uh, and, this, the, and two bound states for the respectively uh, lithium six and uh, lithium-7 uh, uh, molecular ions are presented here. So once we ionize the Rydberg molecule wave packet, we project the wave packet onto the ion, uh, ion atom potential. And of course, we project also partially on the bound states in the ion atom potential. So then we can look on the evolution. So in the experiment, they will have time resolve uh, Im imaging of the evolving wave packet. So we, we can hope that we can look on the evolution. So in this plot, I pre the, the, uh, we presented the, the evolving wave packet for two different scattering, initial scattering length of the, of the ion atom potential with the step uh, every five, 50 nano, uh, uh, nanoseconds. So f every 50 nanoseconds up to, up to uh, mm, uh, one micro, microsecond. And the initial wave packet is somewhere up here because it's, it's, it's much more peaked than the, than, than the evolving wave packet. And what we can check that uh, when we look on the position of the maximum of this evolving wave packet, in fact, it depends on the scattering length. It depends on the scattering length because part of the initial wave packet is projected onto the bound molecular state. So it means that the energy of the resulting part of the wave packet to have the same expectation value of the energy for the system must be different. So for this reason, the evolving wave packet has a different speed. And if we are able to observe the nodes of this propagating ion atom wave packet in the experiment, we are able to, 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 to assign the scattering length for this potential. And we find that depending on the scattering length, we can use two methods. So if the scattering length is in the negative range, we can use the velocity, the, the, the propagation of the maximum of the wave packet as the indicator of the scattering length, whereas if we are in the positive range of the scattering length, then we can look at the fraction of formed, uh, weak, of, formed, of formed weakly bound molecular ions versus the scattering length, because we have this, this kind of dependence where for some range of the scattering length, up to 50% of the initial wave packet is projected directly to the molecular bound state. And depending on the scattering length, uh, it can be a bit different. But once we go for scattering length smaller than zero, then almost nothing is projected to the bound state. So then we have to use this this second uh, approach with the observing velocity. So in this way, we propose two methods of measuring the uh, ion atom scattering length in this kind of experiment. And at the same time, I also, uh, there is no error bars, but so these two uh, are the scattering lengths that we predicted for the lithium system, for the lithium six, I mean, lithium ion plus lithium atom six and seven. And error bars, there are not visible <laughs> here, but there are here somewhere around, like they are of the size of one, uh, one, uh, 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 one uh, um, characteristic length scale uh, for, 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 for uh, lithium-6. And they are much larger for the lithium-7 because uh, we are already in the very large scattering length regime. So of course, the, the uncertainty should be rather compared not to the absolute value of the scattering length, but 
uh, rather to the to the uncertainty of the of the phase, and then it corresponds to 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 several several uh, characteristic length scale of the uncertainty. But still, we have the error bars that should at least indicate that we, the the scattering rate should be really large and positive for the lithium seven, and we hope to confirm it in the future in the experiment. So to sum up. Uh, I presented theoretical description of the iterbium uh, ion plus lithium atom. I presented the first experimental uh, results from the group of René Geritzma for this system, confirming the correctness of our theoretical predictions and, and giving the new challenges for the Abinicio ab uh, calculation community. And finally, I presented the new proposal uh, from, uh, from the group of René, uh, from the group of Tillman Pfau for for using the Rydberg molecules to really go directly into the ultra cold regime of the ion atom scattering. Uh, thank you very much for attention. Okay, so no, not much time left, but maybe a short question. Yes. Excuse me? Yes. So uh, finally, it was only two valence electrons, so only S, S electrons. So this is no, so no F electrons. No, no F, F electrons. So I I'm, I was able to include F electrons, but without including the excited state orbitals. So somehow, but this is a bit artificial because the the F excited as the excited state that contain F excitation, they are surrounded by the excitation of. So it's like including of two of them was not possible. But uh, yeah, we hope that uh, by, by collaborating with some groups that are maybe developing this kind of methods at DH. So most probably it, will, it can be enough if we can include maybe the only the static correlation. So if we can use the methods uh, that can really deal with the highly multi-reference nature, because, uh, because probably included both of them will be not possible. For, but in which experiment? Uh, uh, ah, yes, yes, no. So, so they, they, so they, they, they check the excited states, but in the, in, uh, they, they plan to use the, the, the ion in the ground state. So the applications, I mean, will be to investigate, uh, I think, dynamics. So one of the, prop one of the um, reasons for, for this experiment was this proposal of quantum simulations of, of the, of the bound structure of fermionic atoms around the chain of lithium, uh, of iterbium. Uh, uh, ions. So, so this is the plan, I think, to to go into this direction. Yeah, but we talk about excited. Ah, yes. So, we, we, but yes. So, this are the, so the only the measurement was done only for this free excited state. So, so this was like to 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 have control because, of course, there are the laser are used to 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 to, to yeah. for the preparation and control of the ions. So, so to be to know what kind of losses are induced if we are in that state. Other questions. I don't know if I need the microphone. But Can you hear me all right? Okay. Uh, oh, I see. Okay. Uh, uh, well, I didn't expect to have the last word <laughs> at this workshop, uh, and I'm certainly not going to attempt to review the whole workshop. I'm going to focus on an overview of uh, some of the experiments we've done at UConn with our ion neutral hybrid trap uh, and recently uh, my latest student Jonathan Kolek who is here at the meeting uh, has been doing most of the work in the lab 
Uh, we've collaborated with a previous student, Douglas Goodman, who's now on the faculty at the uh, Wentworth Institute in Boston, James Wells, who is uh, in the science department, the Keck Science Department in Claremont, California. And uh, some time ago, we got uh, Ronald Blumel from Wesleyan, who had a long history of working with Powell Traps uh, to collaborate on simulations. So uh, this is the experimental group uh, with the help of a theorist, uh, Reinhold, and we've been collaborating for years with uh, Robin Cote's group, and recently we have uh, uh, begun working with uh, Brendan McLaughlin and Jim Babb uh, here at ITAMP. Uh, so uh, uh, we, we have a number of uh, collaborators. Let's see if I can make this work. Uh, there we go. Okay, so here's an outline of what I'll talk about. Uh, uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the experiment, about sympathetic ion cooling, calcium on sodium charge exchange reactions and channels, uh, Doug Goodman's thesis, which was 350 pages long, was about the sodium plus sodium collision rate from loss rate measurements uh, and uh, compare with theory and simulations. Uh, and then uh, James Wells's thesis uh, was an exploration of the nonlinear uh, behavior of uh, a Powell trap uh, as a function of loading rate from a MOT. And uh, I'll mention that we have a couple of papers already published, uh, and we're still working on that. And I probably will not. Uh, attempt to discuss that in detail, but it, it is uh, published in PRA. So uh, the basic uh, hybrid trap idea, we start with a MOT, uh, the six uh, optical molasses laser beams, uh, and uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have a getter that produces uh, sodium vapor, which is then trapped in the MOT, and we have an, a Powell ion trap. Uh, in, in this particular case, uh, the, uh, the center electrodes are relatively long compared to the end caps, which have DC potentials to hold the ions uh, in longitudinally. And then the, it's, a, it's a standard linear Powell trap, uh, with the exception that it has a very large central RF region. Uh, so we put the two together. We have a hybrid trap. Uh, I think the uh, first time that uh, I saw this discussed was uh, I, I gave a talk at the uh, Coherence and Quantum Optics Conference. Uh, I think it was actually 2002, but it's published in, in uh, the proceedings of, of this conference, which were, was edited by Nick Bigelow. Uh, and uh, so we actually talked about this very simple idea of combining uh, a neutral atom trap, which produces uh, cold atoms, uh, with, uh, with an ion trap, and, and then studying interactions. Uh, and as far as the trap depths are concerned, uh, the Powell trap for the ions can have a trap depth of the order of 1 eV or more, uh, and the MOT, uh, this may be a, an upper limit, but the trap depth is of the order of a few tenths of a, of a Kelvin. Uh, and uh, here is the quadrupole field that you would get from a pair of, of uh, rods. Uh, we have four rods, and this is, uh, this is an oscillating potential, and if you put a, a ball in this potential and you oscillate it fast enough so the ion can't roll out before it reverses, then you can trap the ion. And there's a beautiful video, uh, which I think is on YouTube by Ted Hench. If you haven't seen it, I recommend it. It shows that Powell traps can come in all shapes and sizes. So what we have is a pseudo potential, and the ion uh, classical trajectory is modulated by at the RF frequency. Uh, and uh, the first approximation, we have a, 
a uh, harmonic pseudo-potential, quadratic potential uh, in the transverse direction uh, with the wiggles at the RF frequency. Uh, but of course there are effects like RF heating which uh, complicate the situation. Now what uh, what is sometimes done is to say that the size of the trap, this is in the transverse plane perpendicular to the four rods, uh, that uh, you could trap particles in a volume that goes from the center to one of the electrodes uh, that in our case are, fi are finite size. They're not, uh, it's not a, uh, a special shape, but we tried to optimize it in a certain sense. If you, uh, if, if you look at the actual uh, trapping radius, it turns out to be smaller than this maximum dimension. Uh, and at the end, I'll show you a uh, classical chaos boundary, uh, which seems to be the limiting uh, feature of, uh, of our trap. Uh, and then this is just to show, well, you could make quantum gates out of ions, but basically, uh, a MOT would, would be uh, in, in this temperature range, uh, say a 10, to the, uh, 10 to the minus 4 Kelvin, and the ions uh, probably a little warmer, uh, but you can look at interactions uh, in that low temperature range uh, where hopefully one can see some quantum effects. And what are some of the things you can look at? Uh, I'm not going to go over the polarization potential. Uh, which has been discussed many times. Here, here's a picture of our actual uh, sodium mott with uh, the rods in the background. Looks like a little uh, yellow star suspended in space. And uh, for, for many years, we were uh, we we found that uh, our mott was not very stable because our laser was not very stable. Uh, and the, the secret uh, in the last few years has been getting a laser, which is uh, one of these tapered amplifier SHG lasers that puts out one watt of uh, sodium D2 line uh, with a line width of a few hundred megahertz, a uh, few hundred kilohertz, sorry. So uh, our, our MOT is, uh, is beautifully stable. Uh, and uh, one can look at effects like sympathetic cooling, one can look at charge transfer. Uh, Eric uh, the other day talked uh, quite a bit about quantum chemistry. Uh, we're interested in some of those effects. Uh, and the mesoscopic molecules that were mentioned here earlier, uh, I don't think we're uh, going to get around to uh, looking at those, but that is another interesting area and also uh, Rydberg molecules is, I think, a very interesting area. Uh, so there are two types of MOTs, two different hyperfine transitions uh, that we look at. Uh, the type 1 has a, a higher density and a smaller uh, volume, and we detune about 14 megahertz from the ground state F equal 2 to the excited F prime equal 3 state and then we repump using a sideband of an electro-optic modulator. In the type 2 mod, uh, it's, it's larger uh, spatially uh, and we actually use the sideband for cooling and we repump with the carrier, uh, but we see both of these mods and we've taken data using both, uh, both types of mods, which uh, has some advantages. So here is a schematic of our setup. Uh, with the sodium ion cloud in red and the sodium mod in the center, uh, and uh, by applying uh, dipole magnetic fields, we can change the overlap uh, using these shim coils. Uh, we can observe uh, the mod uh, and the fluorescence from the ions uh, using a CMOS camera uh, or a photomultiplier tube, and we we detect the uh, trapped ions uh, by uh, sucking them out by changing the potential on the end caps uh, through a mesh into a channel tron multiplier. Uh, so it's a destructive measurement. We have to make repeated measurements in, in order to get anything useful. 
Uh, this is a, a picture of the iron trap itself, and here's the mesh that is right in front of the channel trons. Uh, so you see these are uh, finite size rods, and the potential uh, along the z-axis, for example, has both uh, harmonic and uh, both z-squared and z-to-the-fourth terms, uh, and that, uh, that makes a significant difference. Uh, this is just a picture of the channel tron, and you see fluorescence from calcium ions uh, we repump that. Uh, with, this is the 397 Fraunhofer K line, uh, and uh, we repump it with uh, 866 nanometers with another laser. So uh, the first uh, experiment that we did with this apparatus was to look at sympathetic cooling, and here you have uh, the trap is turned on, so we have. Uh, we have uh, the MOT and the ions, uh, and uh, if, you, uh, if you look at the decay, the exponential decay of the ions in the trap, you see that it decays relatively slowly. We've improved on this quite a bit since uh, 2012. Uh, with, the, uh, with the MOT turned off, the decay is faster, uh, indicating that uh, cooling is going on. So basically this change in the time constant is evidence of sympathetic cooling of equal mass ions, sodium plus, on sodium. I should also mention that we've had collaboration with Frank Narducci uh, of the uh, Naval uh, Sensor Lab in Patuxent River, Maryland. Uh, Frank is now moving to the Naval Postgraduate School in California, and he's going to be doing some teaching as well as research, which I think he's looking forward to doing. So uh, th this was uh, a simulation uh, of the uh, ion-neutral sympathetic cooling. Uh, and uh, if you want to look at the details, it's uh, this PRA in 2012. But basically, uh, this curve here is uh, what happens when you look at the track. When you, when you make the sodium ions from the background gas, I mean, you don't have any, uh, any mot uh, mot on, but just the ion trap. Uh, and uh, this uh, yellow curve is, is uh, cooling, this is a simulation again, cooling from 0.1 EV down to uh, the millikelvin range. Uh, this would be sodium plus on sodium, and this one, which is a little quieter, is, uh, uh, is calcium plus on sodium. And this is what happens if you put uh, multiple ions in. Uh, this is similar to this one over here, but now with multiple ions. And this, uh, this looks like a phase transition. And in the simulation, we were, we were able to see a string of ions. But we have not uh, yet observed that experimentally. We're, we're very close, I think. And we would like to do that because it will help us in calibrating our uh, ion detector. So th these are some photographs of the uh, light from the MOT. Uh, basically, the information you can get out of this is the number of uh, atoms in the MOT and the density, because we have the dimensions, we can get the volume, we can get the density. Uh, the brightness is proportional to the excited state population. We want to be able to vary that, and we also want to be able to measure the temperature, which we do by the standard method of uh, release and recapture. Uh, so uh, w we can uh, turn off the MOT and then turn it back on again and see how many ions remain and, and get a measure of the temperature of the ions, of the atoms, rather, uh, in the MOT. Uh, and th this is the standard definition the probability of an ion atom collision proportional to a cross section times the density of atoms. Uh, 
this is the collision rate by kinetic theory, and here's the rate coefficient, which is symmetric in terms of the number of atoms and ions divided by the volume uh, of overlap of the, of the two. So, uh, all right, so this was uh, the first calculation where we collaborated. Actually, we were not involved in this except that uh, I had many discussions with Robin and Alec Delgarno, uh, the founder of ITAMP, uh, back uh, around the year 2000. Uh, I remember talking with uh, Alex uh, when he was first proposing this institute, so that was quite a while ago. But what this shows is the elastic cross-section as calculated in a quantal calculation, uh, the partial wave calculation, uh, and for S-wave scattering you can see uh, that if you're at uh, in the 10 to the minus 12 atomic unit range, a millikelvin is about here, about uh, a few times 10 to the minus 9 atomic units. So you can see that uh, as you get down into the millikelvin range, the quantal effects become important. Uh, at higher energy, you're sort of in the Langevin classical range. Compare this with the cross-sections for neutral-neutral collisions, and you can see that uh, you have a factor of 100 or more uh, advantage in looking at ion neutral collisions compared to neutral neutral collisions. Uh, at the higher energy uh, the, uh, for an, an ion neutral collision, uh, the cross section goes as e to the minus one third, which is the line that you see here. Uh, so uh, these these were quantal calculations uh, that uh, of sodium plus on sodium in, in these, these states. Uh, and uh, at, at the higher energy, it, it follows this very exactly. All right, let's move on. Now, well, one of the techniques that we found very useful, actually, we learned from the Indian group of uh, Sadiq uh, Rangwala uh, et al., uh, that we look at the light coming from the MOT, uh, we have basically a charging exponential. We have the ion trap off and we get an exponential like this. Uh, if we put photoionization on, if we add a, a, a beam which photoionizes uh, the MOT atoms from the P state, from the excited state, then uh, the number of trapped atoms goes down. Uh, we are losing those and we're assuming uh, that if we set up our ion trap correctly, that uh, we'll, we'll get uh, all of the ions which are uh, coming from the MOT will be trapped. But this is, this, is actually, uh, this is actually with the ion trap off, and then when we put the ion trap on, we get a further reduction, uh, and so we can... We can uh, we can measure uh, the, uh, the, the charging exponential con uh, constant of these curves and determine a rate coefficient for the ion atom interaction. So that's the way the experiments are done. Uh, this is uh, a measurement of the total sodium plus sodium collision rate uh, by this technique. Uh, and here you, you see uh, what, what I just showed before, these charging exponentials. Over here you can see that as the, uh, as the MOT and the ion cloud are separated, uh, you can see that the rate goes down. And so uh, it's important to show that uh, it's due to the interaction of the ions and the, and the atoms. Uh, now, this was a, a measurement involving charge exchange uh, in 2014, and basically uh, what we do here is we come in with excited sodium, uh, that's this purple curve, and ground state calcium plus. So we, have, we, we don't have a calcium MOT, we, we generate calcium plus by 
In, in this experiment, it was done with an electron gun. Later, we used Rempe to uh, generate the ions. Uh, uh, but uh, So we have ground state calcium on excited sodium, uh, and there appears to be some sort of uh, interaction here uh, with uh, the state below it, uh, another singlet sigma where the calcium comes out excited but neutral and the sodium uh, loses its electron and ends up uh, uh, with just uh, sodium plus in the ground state. And again, if we look at the uh, decay of the ions uh, with, uh, with no mott and with a mott, we see there's a much there's a much faster decay with the mod on than with the mod off, and we can interpret this in terms of a rate coefficient for, uh, well, for some kind of charge transfer, and the, the most obvious one is between the purple curve and the dotted curve here. Uh, we've since improved this by several orders of magnitude uh, this was done with an electron gun, so there were some ion impurities in there. And now, uh, by uh, using uh, a one-photon resonance and a second photon to ionize the calcium from the vapor, uh, we've got a much longer time constant. I think I have that in the next slide. Uh, so here we go. Uh, this one is with no MOT, and we have a time constant of 1,500 seconds. With the mod on, you get a rather peculiar behavior where you get a time constant of five seconds, and then uh, the background, uh, there's no significant difference. The error bars are such that uh, the slopes here are almost the same. Uh, and the peculiar thing is that there, there's really a kink in this curve. And we think what this indicates so, so this is preliminary unpublished data. Calcium plus on excited sodium goes to excited calcium neutral plus sodium plus. We don't actually verify the state of the excited calcium, but uh, it appears that uh, not only are we getting charge exchange, but we're also cooling the ions. And by looking at some of the calculations that Cote's group has done, uh, we... Uh, uh, we, we think that this indicates that the ions are actually being cooled below a 17 millivolt barrier so that uh, uh, so that, th th that makes this a very sharp break in the curve. Uh, in the triplet system, which uh, Jim Babb and uh, Brendan McLaughlin have looked at, uh, there appears to be no barrier. Uh, but we haven't uh, definitively identified that yet. Now, uh, I'm going to move uh, fairly quickly here. This is data that uh, Jonathan uh, took very recently showing the charge exchange as a function of the excited state fraction of the Mott-trapped sodium atoms. And uh, you can sort of imagine extrapolating this down to zero excited state, state fraction uh, it looks like the cross-section uh, gets very, very small uh, unless you're in the excited state. So uh, we're pretty sure we know the channel that is involved here. Uh, now, I should comment, uh, in the uh, 2014 paper, we got a rate constant of 2 times 10 to the minus 11. The data that I just showed you is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 11 essentially in agreement, and the Langevin rate is about an order of magnitude, uh, two orders of magnitude larger. So uh, if, I'm not going to go back to that slide, but if you look at, if you look at the potential curves, it appears that the probability of a transfer is much less than 100 percent, and I think that's consistent with what we're seeing here. Okay, let's, uh, now, um, this is what uh, we've been doing recently, uh, looking at the loading of ions into a linear Powell trap. Uh, here are two of the papers, so I'm, I'm not going to dwell on those at all, but this involves 
uh, collaboration with uh, Rhino Blumel from Wesleyan. Uh, we, we, I don't know what happened to Wesleyan. They were supposed to be on here too. Uh, any, anyway, uh, our support has come primarily from NSF. Uh, and uh, here's an example of loading ions into the Powell trap uh, using uh, exciting the sodium atoms and then photoionizing near the threshold with a second laser. Uh, and the loading rate uh, is what we're measuring as a function or we're, we're, we're measuring actually the number, the saturated number of ions as a function of loading rate, the steady state ion number, because this is a solid number you can get from the level of that curve. Uh, and uh, what Blumel's uh, simulations show is there are actually four regions as a function of ion loading rate. Uh, if, if you do the simulation using the pseudo potential and not the actual RF Powell trap, then this part of the curve goes away and, and it's, it's essentially flat across there. So it appears that this part of the curve, which has a power law dependence, is due to RF heating. Uh, at very high loading rate, uh, there's a lot of space charge in the trap, which weakens the trapping effect. You get another power law here. Uh, and then uh, there, there's, a, there's a dip in between, and there's a plateau here. But so far, we have not been able to achieve a loading rate much higher than this, which is one ion per RF cycle. So that's a loading rate of about a million ions per second. Uh, but so far, it appears to follow. Uh, uh, Blumel simulations. Okay, uh, so here's the power law that applies to the high loading rate, which we haven't yet measured. Uh, this shows the uh, saturated steady state ion number as a function of trap depth, Powell trap depth, and different loading rates, uh, and it shows uh, this this power law here, uh, it agrees not quite perfectly, but quite, quite closely with the theoretical model, and that's this 2017 paper. Uh, now, this, this, uh, this shows the, uh, the fact that the, there is, is a radius smaller than the distance to the rods, at which point the ions seem to be detrapped. And um, Blumel has calculated a chaos boundary. Uh, these are the lifetimes of the ions in the trap. And you can see the black region, the lifetime, uh, is, a thousand, is greater than 1,000 RF cycles. And the blue, it's less than 3 RF cycles. And this has a fractal structure. So that it this is not true for all Powell traps, but for a Powell trap like ours, which has both the z squared and the z to the fourth term, uh, you, you do get this uh, chaos effect. And so that was something that we hadn't expected uh, that came out of the measurements. So here, here are the loading uh, conclusions. We have analytical, whoops, we have analytical models. Let's see if I can go back. Uh, we have analytical models that uh, match the experiment in uh, the low loading rate and the intermediate one. Uh, ions are lost before they reach the electrodes due to uh, chaotic trajectories, uh, and uh, that's due to the particular structure of our trap where the electrodes are rather large in diameter compared to the spacing. Uh, okay, now some prospects. I wanted to spend, I don't know how much time I have left here. Five, okay, that should be enough. Uh, the, the one that interests me the most, uh, and this is preliminary data, but uh, we need to verify this, uh, is an intrinsic hydri hybrid trap effect where uh, what one looks at is the uh, the the uh, 
one looks at the Mott loading, the, the differential equation for loading the Mott, and it has a linear term and it has a quadratic term that could, for example, be due to something like photoassociation from the excited state. Uh, and uh, so you look at the coefficient of the quadratic term uh, with the ion trap on the black or the ion trap off. And it, it seems that these, these binary atom-atom collisions are affected by the presence of the ions. And although the details of the mechanism remain to be discovered, there, uh, there are possibilities. One of them is that each ion will be surrounded by a polarization sphere of atoms. It's a little bit like this, uh, this Rydberg uh, cold atom interaction, but this is an ion uh, increasing the local density around each ion inside the MOT, and any atom-atom process which involves uh, a binary, involves uh, the number of atoms squared, or the density squared, like associative ionization, uh, will be enhanced by that. And we think that that may be the reason why uh, uh, this effect occurs. But uh, this is essentially independent of the uh, photoionizing laser power, uh, but depends on the number of trapped ions. Okay, here's another experiment I think I heard from uh, Roe. There's been work with strontium at the Weizmann Institute and other places. Uh, this was something that uh, we proposed, but we've never done it. I don't know if we ever will, but essentially uh, the idea was to ch uh, change the overlap between the mod and the ion cloud. Uh, if uh, we, we know how to make vibrationally hot Na2+, we can, we can make vibrationally cold Na2+, by 3P plus 3P collisions, photoassociation. If we do 3P plus 3D collisions, we were able to use some electron spectroscopy and other uh, methods to verify that the Na2 plus uh, rate was not only enhanced, but it was vibrationally hot. Uh, and in that, so then what happens is as the uh, excited sodium um, molecule, the vibrationally heated sodium molecule interacts with uh, the mod atoms, you, you overlap the two, uh, you cool off the vibrational excitation, and there is a, an accidental resonance in Na2+, which is at the, uh, the same wavelength, at the D2 wavelength that we used to make the MOT in the first place. So what happens is that when you have overlap, uh, the Na2+, photo dissociates, giving you sodium ions, and when there's no overlap, then you get a larger amount of Na2+, and a smaller amount of Na plus. So uh, by this technique, uh, we would hope to be able to measure uh, the vibrational quenching that I think some others have already measured in other systems. So I'm going to end here. Uh, this is just a uh, list of some of the early papers, and I showed you, I think, most of the more recent papers. We have a couple of RSI uh, instrumentation papers as well. This was uh, uh, the uh, conference in Rochester where we first proposed uh, the hybrid trap idea. Uh, this was a theory calculation of uh, calcium plus on Na uh, in uh, the ultra-cold region. Uh, and uh, this is a paper uh, based on a talk I gave at the Snowbird PQE conference, and then I spent a semester here at ITAMP and finished up this paper in 2005, and so that's published in the Journal of Modern Optics. Uh, this was a demonstration of sympathetic cooling. Uh, th this uh, RSI paper is a, a way of doing a mass analysis. We don't have the beautiful time of flight system that Eric has as yet. Uh, th this is uh, simulations about sympathetic cooling, and uh, these are experiments on charge exchange, and then I showed you some of the more recent experiments. So I think this is 
a good place to stop, and I, I certainly thank the organizers for inviting me, and I thank ITAMP for holding this workshop. Uh, Hossein will remember that Robin Cote and I proposed a similar workshop several years ago, but it never happened, and I think now is a better time to hold it. It's, it's very clear that this whole field is really had going places and lots of good physics has come out and uh, it's nice to be associated with that. So thank you very much. Hope it was clear. Okay.